Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is from Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Let us read Psalm 118 in unison. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim. His mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. There is a sound of exultation and victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has punished me sorely, but he did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you, for you answered me, and have become my salvation. 
The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The epistle this Easter is taken from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter began to speak to Cornelius and the other Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message you sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that anyone and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. 
he bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their own homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. I was cross-eyed as a baby. Happy Easter. I was. I was cross-eyed as a baby. I wasn't too noticeably cross-eyed, not so that strangers on the street would notice it um, unless you knew to look for it in early pictures of of little baby Megan, but it's definitely there. My parents noticed it, and they took me to see a doctor eventually, who immediately told them that I was fine, I wasn't seeing double, and they were being hysterical new parents. What we figured out later is that the doctor was sort of right. By the time the doctor saw me, my brain and the muscles around my eyes had learned how to compensate for the tiny imperfections in my face. And so I was no longer seeing double by the time that doctor saw me. And that process is fairly common in babies and very young children. Somehow the brain in infants just figures out that it would be a lot easier to see one of something in three dimensions than it is to constantly see two of something in two dimensions and like fall into stuff all the time. And then your brain just does it, figures out a way to make that happen. And in the process, your brain contorts the muscles around your eyes and in your face to just make that work. And usually this workaround begins to stop working as well once you get older and you reach young adulthood and your face changes shape and your muscles start to get tired because you're reading a lot in school. This is basically what happened to me. And when that happens, you suddenly discover that this way of seeing that you had had your entire life, this method of perception, has been not quite a lie, but also not quite entirely the truth either. And in the process, you discover that vision, something that seems so simple and and straightforward actually depends on countless tiny things all working perfectly at once, every single time. And if just one little thing is off, well, that's the ball game, and you're going to walk into a wall. If your glasses prescription is off, if your glasses are askew on your face, if you're tired, if your head is at an angle that it's not normally at, if, if, if you blink funny, then 
bam. You are back to seeing two of everything and falling down all the over the place. And so what I gleaned from this experience is not so much the miracle of the human organism, though I suppose that's part of it. What I gleaned from this experience is the frailty of the human organism. We as creatures are so complex. We aren't perfectly tuned machines. We aren't computers that someone built in a lab, so much as we are overly elaborate creatures with finicky parts that cannot stand for one tiny speck of dust to upset our delicate balances. Now, we are creatures who have made it off the planet, and we have made it to the moon, and now we have made it to Mars, but we are so fragile that a variant of the common cold can shut down the whole world for a year because our immune system just gets confused and goes into overdrive and drowns us. It's an odd business, being human. It's an odd business having a human body with these mortal parts, with so staggeringly much that can go wrong every second of every day. We are such frail creatures, always at the whim of one force or another. And then that internal essential frailty is compounded not only with our mortalness, with our mortality, but it is compounded with threats from outside, with the violence and the brutality that so often characterizes what we do to one another. And so we live, us humans, in these all too breakable containers, so mindful of our very fragility in a world that likes nothing better than to break things. We live in bodies where so much can go wrong, and we live in a world where so much does go wrong. And in the past year, we have witnessed that failure time and time again. We have witnessed the failures of our institutions. We have witnessed the failures of our societies. We have witnessed the failures of our leaders and the failures often and tragically of our very selves. And so in the face of all of this fragility and failure, it might seem reasonable to believe that the appropriate response by the creator of all of this, it might seem that the appropriate response to the creator of so much fragility is to throw up your hands to shrug the almighty shoulders and to say, well, that's the way it goes. What really matters is getting out of this mess anyway. What really matters is the afterlife because I made that better anyway. Earth is just practice for that. That's going to be where I really got it right. That might seem like the appropriate divine response to so much that is uncertain. And yet, when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb that Sunday morning, she probably wasn't thinking in terms of dismissal, dismissive theological platitudes but she probably also wasn't expecting anything more than what had come before. She probably was just expecting the same as has always been in her life, another loved one to bury, another friend to grieve, another pain to feel, and another injustice to shoulder through her life. Here was more uncertainty. Here was more fragility that she had to suffer through. 
But instead, what she found at the tomb that morning was none of that. What she found at the tomb that morning was an empty tomb. What she found was the risen Christ and a transformed world. Easter, this miracle of miracles, contains for us God's response to the failures of the world and the failures of ourselves. Easter contains the declaration that when God looked upon this creation, God gave us not a divine shrug, not a promise that, well, heaven was going to be better, but God plunged in personally and gave us a way not to be broken anymore, not to be condemned to eternal futility, injustice, suffering, and grief anymore. In the light of Easter morning, we see God's emphatic response to the broken, suffering creation. God says, I will love you even more, and I will do it up close. On Easter, God does not build for us an escape ladder so that our trials here will feel better once they're over. God gives to us the first example that our struggles and our sorrows here are not going to win, no matter what. God proves to us in the resurrection of Christ that this once and for all is God's world, God's creation, that this creation was made in love and is made about life, that brokenness and death that we experience within it will not last forever because God will not allow it. This morning, This Easter morning, God hands to all of us who stand grieving before the tombs of our own mortality and our own brokenness and the world's sinfulness a promise that what we suffer will not only not last forever, but it will be transformed into newer, richer, and more abundant life. God promises us that our barren places will not be abandoned by God's love, but will be redeemed and enriched and transfigured by the glory of Christ's resurrection, and that God's faithful promise to us and to all creation throughout history is that our fragility isn't a curse. It is a way for God to enter into our experience and to redeem it. On this Easter morning, God comes to us and God beckons us to work with him to transfigure all the world into the bright, shining glory of the Easter morning. Amen. Now let us stand and affirm the faith of the Church in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
the prayers of the people are in your bulletin. Washed in the waters of Christ's death and resurrection, that we might enter the community of faith, let us praise our Lord by offering our prayers and thanksgiving as we respond. Hear us, O risen Lord. Risen Lord, mold us into your new creation, that we may seek the radiance of your light as found in the lives of the saints and as revealed through the generosity of our sisters and brothers. Let us pray. Hear us, O risen Lord. Eternal Christ, help us journey through this life with compassion and vision, entering into the sufferings of the world, that we might know the depth of your truth and the dwelling place of your love. Let us pray. Hear us, O risen Lord. Saving Lord, stretch out the strong arms of your grace and lift up those who are hungry and downtrodden, lonely and forgotten so that all of humanity may be reconciled to you and to one another. Let us pray. Hear us, O risen Lord. Christ, our Passover, may the nations of the world seek after peace and thirst anew for the freedom of men and women everywhere. May we pass from domination to mutual trust, from economic intimidation to responsible use of the world's resources from thoughts of destruction to respect for all life. Let us pray. Hear us, O risen Lord. Jesus, bread of heaven, nourish us in this holy sacrament of your unending presence, that we may become for one another your bread of hope and your cup of joy. Let us pray. Hear us, O risen Lord. Jesus, Savior, risen Lord, we thank you for all the blessings of this life, for the family and friends who reveal your love, for those who have died in the faith, for those who have entered our communities through baptism, for all things that enliven our spirits, and especially for the Paschal flame that outshines every darkness. Let us pray. Hear us, O risen Lord. Rejoicing in the garments of new life, let us continue our prayers. For the special needs and concerns of our congregation, and especially for Theodore, Catherine, Laura, John, James, Dara, Kathleen, Martha, Mary, Jay, Lorraine, Wes, John, Michelle, Alan, Lorraine, Susan, Mary, Barb, Edith, Joan, Michelle, Lucy, Jean, Carol. Lifting these are prayers to you, O God. Let us say together the words our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
This is the part where I would normally have tons of announcements to share with you, but on this uh, joyous Easter day, all I want to do is send a huge thank you to everyone who worked so hard to make our Holy Week services, our Lenten services, and our Easter services a profound experience. Thank you especially to our choir members, to our director of music, Karen, and to everyone else who worked on the live streaming, um, on greeting, on being an usher, and of all the varied ways to make uh, Holy Week a profound experience. As always, church is a team effort. We don't do this alone, and I am profoundly grateful to each and every one of you. And now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen.